Hey, 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 good morning, afternoon, or evening, good people, wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, and however we're together. Thanks for being here. I'm Dave, and this is Dave's Head. So what's in my head? First of all, uh, what the hell is wrong with DC? No, seriously. It's it's just a mess, clusterfuck, catastrophe, whatever word you want to associate with it. It's it's undeniable dysfunction in DC. And I'll get into why in a second. But if you look at politics in DC, I always say I'm I'm politically aware since the year 2000. Before 2000, I was a young teen, adolescent, young adult, didn't care about politics. Didn't even vote. Didn't, you know, I was registered. Didn't matter. Didn't vote. Didn't care. Um, but then 2000, I started to be more aware, more um, informed, if you will, about the goings on and especially my local, my local and state politics, but started paying attention to nationals as well. And so I voted for the first time in 2000. I voted for Bush. I'll put it out there. I voted for Bush in 2000. I was one of them. I've always been that way. I've, I'm a registered independent, been a registered independent all my life. Um, I vote for who I consider the best candidate can do for me and people I care about. Um, I learned a valuable lesson that I'll get into later about um, politics and voting and all that stuff. They all lie. I'll cut to the chase. But if you look at the last two decades, and really two decades more because we're 2023 now, politics has really been declining. You go back to 9-11 and you look at how a lot of politicians use fear um, to lie and get what they want and profit off of it. even that. Look at the Iraq war. Look at Homeland Security. Look at a lot of the anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant agendas that have plagued us since. And plagued, by plagued us, I mean been, we've just bombarded with this stuff. Right. If you want to get elected, push some anti-Muslim, push some anti-immigrant stuff. Right. Everybody's got a talking point these days. If you go back to even more recent times, 2008, and look at when President Obama ran for um, election the first time. And if, if, <laughs> if you want to be truthful, John McCain really was the last politician. You know, if you, if you look at two candidates that ran. Right. And both sides kind of trying to be stand up ish, honest ish, um, not really slinging mud ish people. He did have Sarah Palin, but but um, trying to maintain civility. Right. Uh, but, you know, back in when Obama ran, it was, it was the Muslim, the socialist, the Kenyan birtherism, all that stuff. Right. Joe the plumber uh, rest peacefully, I guess. I, I think he passed in the last two months, three months, maybe. Um, but he became, you know, 12 minutes famous. I know they say 15, but he really kind of had like 12 um, minute famous for his question of Obama on a campaign trail in which I think Obama paraphrasing basically said, we've got to share the wealth. I think it was, it might've been an exact quote, but it was, it was pretty close to that. And so it became overnight sensation. Obama's a socialist. He wants to spread wealth and take wealth and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But really politics haven't recovered since that initial 2008, when you had the Islamophobia maxing out. You had the socialist thing kind of ramping up. People still can't tell you today what the hell socialism is, but they knew that Obama was a socialist. The whole Kenyan thing, which, I mean, let's be honest, had nothing to do with the country, had to do with the color. Let's just be real. And the birtherism thing, which again, really had nothing to do with actual facts and legitimacy, was more to do with color. How can we muddy up this person? And so... Politics really haven't recovered since then. And in and, and many ways to me has really only gotten worse. And you think about what's followed and re really started in 2008 as well. But Trump and mega cults and all that stuff. And now we find ourselves at a point in D.C. where Congress is so extreme, so absolutely extreme that for the first time in history, this long country, all the crap that this country has done, right? Positive, negative, all the stuff this country has done. For only the first time in history, the Speaker of the House, who is second in line to the presidency, meaning President, Vice President, Speaker of the House, like Kamala and, and Joe get taken down, the Speaker's House is the President. 
but that person was removed from office. In fact, right now we sit and exist in a state where I think we're about a week in of having no official constitutional house <laughs> representative, speaker of the house. It, it just is it, mind boggling. And we can only blame Kevin McCarthy, right? So he's the Trump lap dog that fell victim to the, the psycho extreme right wings of the world, the Matt Gates, right? Who like just has that face you want to punch repeatedly. Matt Gates, just look at him, seriously. You want to punch that. But he, he got in bed with him in order to get his speakership and gave him the opportunity to only need one person in the House of Representatives to call for a basically essentially a recall of or no, you know, trust or no support vote um, to remove McCarthy. And he lost. Essentially, he said he didn't need the Democrats. Democrats didn't vote for him to stay. Not a single one. They kind of held together, say, hey, that's on you. Republicans, you have the majority. You don't have to vote them out, but we're not going to help you keep them either. And there's a lot more to that. You know, after the, if you remember, um, there was a threat of the government shutdown. McCarthy got Democrats to support his measures to get, you know, prevent that or extend it for, I think it was 90 days or whatever it was. Um, and then that same weekend, he goes on TV and starts bashing Democrats and saying it was their fault they were even in the mess in the first place. Democrats took offense and said, okay, you know, it's like the Michael Jordan and I was offended. And so when this whole thing with uh, creeper Matt Gates came up, Democrats said, well, this is all y'all, y'all got the majority. Y'all can vote to keep them. Y'all can vote to lose them. And so I think it was eight was a number of Republicans that voted to kick him out along with every Democrat. And so now we're here with a temporary speaker of the house, if you will. And we're left with the choices of Jim Jordan, who's that Trump knobber. Um, yeah, I said it, Trump knobber. Um, he's, he's also the guy who allegedly turned his back on wrestlers at Ohio State getting inappropriately touched. You know, kind of reminds me of the guy from Penn State. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he was under Joe Paterno, um, who kind of let things happen as well. And Steve Scalise, who... Um, you know, he's kind of battling blood cancer, which I, I can't even imagine that because cancer of the blood has got to be crazy serious. I mean, blood touches every damn near part of your body. Um, so best wishes to him for that. Um, he also survived a shooting in 2017 when some nut job uh, went up. I think it was a baseball game. I think they do the congressional baseball game and they were practicing for that. And some guy decided to shoot it up. Um, but he also has the scandal of his own, you know, addressing um, a white supremacist group in 2022 who was you know, founded by a former KKK leader. He claims he didn't know any of that going in. Sure. Okay. But with the, in the mix of all this stuff going on, this whole greatest country in the world thing that we have, uh, we kind of put out there and kind of regurgitate over and over and over again. We don't look that great. Do we? As far as democracy, we're not, we're not the, the stable genius. We think we are right. We're not the standard bearer. We're not the template for success. And for a long time, we're not. This notion that America is the standard bearer around the world, I don't think holds true. And it gets back to that whole make America great again thing. Because if it's about making America great, being number one in things that actually benefit the people in this country, you know, give me a red hat. I'm, I'm all about MAGA. If it's about the people, I just don't think that's what MAGA is really about. And coming full circle back to Congress and the mess that Congress is right now. I railed on term limits forever and ever and ever. We got to get term limits. It's the only way to fix this problem, I see. We got to get these power hungry, always feeling like somebody wants to come for their power, money grubbing because they come in making you know, what I make and leave you know, multi, double digit, triple digit millionaires. There's a reason they fight so hard to keep those positions because... They don't want to lose that power and that money. And so term limits, term limits, term limits, I think is a way to fix this. But for now, we can't even pass a freaking budget. Just go look up research. When's the last time an actual balanced budget was passed in Congress and who passed it and what year? Just check it out. We're an absolute mess. The second thing that's on my mind is unprofessionalism. 
you know, there's 24 steps, literally 24 steps that I go through to produce a quality episode. Or at least I hope it's a quality episode. You can tell me if it's not uh, for this podcast. In four seasons, almost completed four seasons, I've had before this episode, two instances where I've had to replace a guest last minute. One was a complete family emergency, like life and death type of thing. Completely understand. The other one was a late cancellation, which although it kind of threw me into a quick replacement mode, at least they let me know. Now, I'm very happy about the guests I have for this episode, but I will put out there just like I did the last two times or the only other two times this happened. They were not the original guests that I have for this episode. I've talked about on my social media and people who know me, my podcast has been booked up solid with guests for the entire year since about February, mid-February, early March. Every episode booked solid, scheduled with guests. I have a waiting list that I could fill the entire next season and probably into season six with people who are waiting to come on and talk about things. I've thought about changing my frequency of um, episodes so that I can accommodate people and not really have them sitting around waiting for months and months and months before the episode that they can come on and, and share their ideas, share their thoughts, share their books, share whatever. I've thought about it. I don't know if that's actually going to happen twice a month. Yeah, the way I'm busy, it's, it's enough for me. But there seems to be this growing problem of unprofessionalism these days. And if you, if you look at my following, I'm no Howard Stern. However, I do have a pretty nice following. Shout out to... Uh, my Ukrainian and African uh, listeners and watchers. I was pretty surprised when I was doing research for this episode and looked up some of my stats and um, some of our viewers and listeners and where the countries they come from. Shout out to Africa. Shout out to Ukraine. Especially Ukraine because you figure everything that's going on in Ukraine. How the hell y'all listening to me? So shout out to you. Um, but I have this automatic process, right? 24 steps from start to finish. And <clears throat> I'm not talking about this really to bitch and moan. I'm not... I, Trust me, I'm, I'm very good at adapting and changing to people, temperaments, unprofessionalism, all that stuff. Trust me, I deal with it a lot. But <laughs> it's more so to talk about really lack of integrity and professionalism or lack of professionalism that's rampant today. If you think about your nine to five job, think about how many people you work with who either A, don't really do their job but because they know someone or know something, they get to get away with that. Or they do their job really, really bad, and for some reason they just aren't fired. They aren't quitting, but they aren't fired either. Or think about the people you come across every single day that either have a higher position than you, or a tenure longer than you, and they get away with being unprofessional, whether it's tone, whether it's the things they say. Um, I, I work in IT. Prof you know, profanity is nothing new to me. Um, but there's a lot of rudeness, unprofessionalism that seems to be rampant all over across industries. Even in, you know, I, I'm a fraternity guy. I think we all know that. I'm wearing a chain on my, my neck right now, if you can see on YouTube and, and um, Spotify, for my fraternity, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And there are some rude brothers in that fraternity, unprofessional brothers in that fraternity, everywhere, every industry across the board. But... <laughs> what slightly annoyed me is I'm really good at what I do. And by what I, what I do, what I mean is I'm really good at being a CYA asshole. Say that again. I'm really good at being a CYA asshole. Now, we all know CYA means cover your ass. I'm really good at being a cover my ass <laughs> asshole. Meaning if I'm emailing you, if I'm sending you a letter, if I'm faxing you, if I'm doing anything official, believe when I tell you I have the tapes. And so it's just the way I work. I have I have folders, personal folders um, where I've kept. I call it mean letters because it's not my MO to be very mean or stern. And sometimes stern can be interpreted as mean. So I just put them as mean letters because that's just what they are interpreted as. They're very, very stern. They're very matter of fact to the point, no emotion, all business. This is what it is. This is what I'm saying. And this is what, whether legal or not, if it's a legal thing, this is legally what I'm explaining or doing or whatever. 
there's no hey how's it going it's mr so-and-so mrs so-and-so sir madam greetings good evening whatever and so this person who essentially no-showed um i was able to monitor their no-show progress meaning anytime i sent them something i attached read receipts to it anytime i forwarded something through one of my automated systems and it was sent to them they read it and so the unprofessional part comes in where you don't say that you can't make it or you won't do it for whatever reason maybe they listen to my podcast that you know as we're approaching the date maybe they listen to my podcast and say you know what i don't agree with this guy's thoughts cool i mean i don't need anyone to agree with my thoughts so it's perfectly fine if you don't however if you don't be man or woman enough to say you don't say you know what i know we schedule this i'm not feeling this anymore cool thanks i'll just move on to the next one list it's not a big deal to me what grinds me up is the unprofessional part now, I'm not going to out this person. I, literally, after I'm finished this mini portion of this segment, I really won't care about them. But I just wanted to point out that there's a right and wrong way to do something. You got to look at how you interact with people. Because here's the thing. You never know, right, what bridge you may be leaving open or what bridge you may be burning. And so how you interact with people goes a long way. Because I may have the worst memory in the world and, yes, my girlfriend can attest to that. My memory is, is shit for some things. I don't know why I have to figure out why it's really good in some areas and really bad in others. But when you interact with people, even for a moment, people remember that. And as you cross different bridges in your life, you never know who knows who, who knows what, who has the ability to network in a way that might bring you back to the person that you interacted with in the unprofessional way. So that's the point. If you interact with somebody, do so in professional manners because you never know down the line where that interaction may or may not lead you. What's in my head is brought to you in part by Digga Movers, your safe and swift moving company. An A plus rated one stop shop licensed and insured moving company providing local and long distance services on the move. For more information, visit their website at www.digamovers.com or call 1-888-77-DIGGUM. That's 1-888-773-4436. The last thing that's on my mind is something absolutely amazing. Roll Tide. That's all I have to say. And 90% 90% of you probably know what I'm talking about. The other 10 don't like sports. Whatever. I am a huge, if you don't know, a huge, huge, huge Roll Tide fan. Roll Tide is the Alabama Crimson Tide college football team in the Southeastern Conference of the NCAA. Multi-champion year. You know, we go way, way back to like the 20s. But in all my years of, as being a fan, a big fan, I've seen... Alabama play in person multiple times. Every single time I've seen them in person has been in a neutral site. I've seen them in Atlanta. I think I saw them once in Texas. Um, neutral sites because the, the crowd draws are so big. It, it just, you know, sometimes a neutral site is better. Or it might be an early season bowl-ish thing. It might be an actual bowl. But back in March of this year, I really on a whim decided this is going to be the year that I'm going to go see Alabama in Alabama at Tuscaloosa, Raymond James Stadium. I'm going to go. Oh, Brian Denny Stadium. I think I said Raymond James. Brian Denny Stadium. Um, I don't know where I got Raymond James from. Weird. Um, but I decided this would be the year I would go see them at home. And so, granted, this year is, you know, we're not the dominant team of old. You know, we're not blowing people out the water, lockdown defense, amazing skill players that were although we're getting better every single week but i get a chance to go this weekend and so by the time this episode actually drops friday the 13th woo, friday the 13th i'll actually be already in the south because the game is saturday um but i get a chance to go walk into a stadium i've been wanting to go into for i can't even tell you how long i wanted to go um now i'm not 
I would say I'm not one for emotional moments. But I think I will have a moment of sort of reflection when I first walk in that stadium. It's, you know, it's one of my bucket list items, number one. Um, but I've talked about before how I used to travel for college football. I used to travel for professional football, um, even some baseball, Major League Baseball. Um, and so I've been to a ton of stadiums in this country, tons of states in this country, following sports, essentially. Um, but I've never had the opportunity to see my favorite team in person play on their home field. And so it's kind of surreal. It's kind of, you know, come full circle, if you will. Um, and something that I think, so I got a couple of favorite teams that are not Philly based. Um, one being the Miami Heat, so that's also on my bucket list to see a Miami Heat game um, courtside if possible. We will see. Um, see a Miami Heat game in person. But I'm going to start with this one. And so, I, listen, I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> the level of excitement on Saturday, um, I'm not sure it will be containable. When I tell you I'm a little bougie when it comes to sporting events, um, kind of like I'm bougie with food and travel everything else but I'm a little bougie when it comes to sporting events and so my seats are ridiculously good uh, but I did pay for them. I am listen I am frankly looking forward to seeing my tide on Saturday and that's what's in my head So the U.S. is about as polarized as it's ever been, at least in my lifetime. Um, as I said in my opening segment, um, it's been getting worse over the last 20 plus years, two decades or so. BigThink.com published an article back in 2022 entitled, These are the seven most partisan issues in America right now, which took information data from, from pre, uh, Pew Research. Um, we'll talk about these seven things really quickly because it's seven things. Uh, the first is climate change. Uh, 78% of Democrats, 21% of Republicans view it as a top priority. Which of these seven is the biggest disparity? Um, my personal opinion, climate change is real. Whether it has impact on us in our lifetime or not, it's going to impact us if we keep on this path. The second thing, environmental protections. Very related to climate change, but environmental protections. 85% of Democrats compared to just 39% of Republicans viewed us as a top priority. Guns. <laughs> 66% to 25%. Democrat, Republican, and ironically, women were 20% more likely than men found that as a top priority topic for them. Military, 66% of Republicans versus 30% of Democrats found this as a top priority issue with older Americans, 30% more likely than younger Americans viewing this as a top priority. Side note, older Americans are also much more likely to support strengthening Social Security while protecting the environment is more of an issue for the younger generation. In America. The fifth thing is immigration, which I was actually surprised just based on, and granted, this is 2022, but I was surprised at the, the gap here. 73% to 40% Republican and Democrat. I thought it'd be closer to that 50 50 or, you know, 70 50 type of range. But men, 59% to 51% for women, found immigration as a top priority issue. Education, which was top three overall across the board old, young, men, women. 80% though to 50% Democrat to Republican. And then lastly, healthcare costs. 80% to 52% Democrat to Republican. Which, uh, fun fact for you, not really fun fact, the U.S. spends about $10,000 per person on healthcare each year. If you're aware of how many people are in this country, that's a whole lot of money. So you look at those issues, seven issues, climate change, environmental protections, guns, military, immigration, education, and healthcare costs, those are, in 2022, the most polarizing issues of the day. I'd argue that a, a year later, it's probably shifted. You probably have privacy, government, as probably jumping into that top, especially with the you know, secret documents, with uh, privacy laws, with X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, those types of things going on. We're talking about politics, because I'm happy to have my guest for this episode, Riddell Lewis. He's a host of a podcast, Purple Political Breakdown, a podcast that aims to, quote, focus on political, social, and cultural solutions without political bias. My favorite words, without political bias. Riddell, welcome to Dave's Head. How's it going? 
I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, I love those words as well. Uh, without political bias, I think it's such a key thing, despite what is going on in our current political climate. Um, but, you know, I emphasize the importance of these conversations, regardless, regardless of your affiliation or your identity in reference to politics. And these conversations should be valuable in trying to find solutions for all the things that you mentioned. Absolutely. And and, and my, my guest, know, or my guest, my um, audience knows this. I'm a lifetime independent, always been a registered independent. So I, I share some Democratic views, some Republican views, although you could probably characterize me as liberal leaning um, just for this conversation. So before we get started, as I always like to do with my guests, I like to have the guests introduce themselves to my audience in their own words. So if you could take a minute, tell the people who you are, what you do and what you're about. So as he said, my name is Riddell, Riddell Lewis. I'm the host of the Purple Political Breakdown. Uh, this is a political podcast that talks about politics, obviously, it talks about social, cultural issues. And the goal at the end of the day is to have conversations with the end goal of all those conversations, finding a solution, actually coming to some type of compromise. And obviously, I practice what I preach or I don't, wouldn't be doing it because I have a lot of different guests. I've had Democrats. I've had Republicans. I had some hosts that was Democrat and Republican. I had all those different identities on one show. I had far right, far left, moderate, of course. I identify as independent, moderate. I just whatever logically makes sense is where I'm leaning. I don't really care about affiliation. And at the end of the day, every single episode that I do on my show has been a productive conversation, an interesting solution was to be found. And even if I disagree, even if it gets a little heated, we still were able to have this conversation in betterment of society at large. Mm -hmm. All this kind of disparity and all this toxicity between both sides is not really benefiting us as a society. And I think a lot of people are kind of feeling the repercussions of all these things for the most part. So that is what my podcast is. That is what my podcast continues to be and continues to preach. We don't try to pretend that we live in this moral high ground, but we do try to show people that it's possible just because you're a Republican, they're a Democrat, to have a conversation, a productive one, more than likely you'll agree on a lot of sentiments and try to push America at the very least and maybe the world in general forward, of course. Yeah, I think that's a it's a, a great ideological way to approach the genesis of disputes in this country, right? To hear what you have to say, hear what I have to say, let's come to a medium, even if we decide ultimately we don't agree with each other on, on the fundamentals of things. Talk about the purple in and I have an idea what it's for, but talk about the purple in your, your title of your podcast. So funny thing, it took a while for me to get to the name that it is currently. And one thing that I always knew is that I always wanted to represent a sense of, you know, mix of the the two sides, right? Republican, red, Democrat, blue, purple also represents this kind of neutrality color as well. And that is what it's for. And it kind of represents my own kind of identity in a sense, too. But it really showcases people. Everybody who listens is like, man, this is, I'm hearing different point of views. Um, the, the point of views are getting challenged. The, we're actually hearing productive conversations, not the same rhetoric you hear all the time on social media or media. So mm -hmm. purple really kind of incent our, is the perfect color to represent what the podcast is about. Gotcha. So let, let, let's dive into it a little bit and let's, let's get into the crux of some of the issues in this country. I talked in my opening segment about Congress and specifically the House of Representatives who lack a constitutionally official <laughs> Speaker of the House. What's wrong with Congress? It's 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 honestly very tough to uh, to say. Um, yes, Kevin McCarthy has been ousted. They're going to choose a new majority leader to be the Speaker of the House. But Congress, the biggest thing that I find an issue is not necessarily how they run things, and they do run things a little bit ineffectively. They take too long to even come up with a budget. It's kind of ridiculous, mm -hmm. and they take a lot too long to kind of come to decisions in general. The compromise that we thought should be happening in Congress, a lot of the times is not happening because either side doesn't want to give any leeway. But I'm going to put the ball in a, someone else's court, and that's the audience. That's the people mm -hmm. voting. The reason why 
is I don't think people realize how important local elections are. They honestly, and I'm be honest from my point of view, should be more important than the federal elections. These people who represent your state, represent your community, have the biggest impact on what goes on with you as an individual compared to the president of the United States. Whether you believe it or not, it is true. Not only that, these individuals are also people that you can definitely get in contact with way easier than the president. You're never going to see the president. You're never going to contact the president. But you have a stronger chance in meeting your state senator, governor, mayor. It doesn't really matter. So having officials, having individuals that truly represent your wants and needs in Congress is a big step forward to make sure that Congress is more representative of the populace at large, of the public at large. So I think that is something important for people to realize because even me growing up, even when I went to college and everything, nobody talked about local elections. It was all about Mm -hmm. Barack Obama versus Donald Trump. You know, it was all about Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Half the, maybe 80% of the people don't even know who their senator is. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. So you got a very select people who tend to be older individuals who tend to be more inclined to participate into politics and maybe even go to these city halls to kind of make their case. Those are the people that tend to vote and their kind of vision on what politics is, is based on who they vote in because not enough people are really trying to participate in these, right? So that's the start. So I think more people should vote in their local elections 100%. Absolutely. And when it comes to Congress itself, there's there's a lot of things that people are debating and changing in terms of the process, of course. I mean, we have a lot of people that are saying, you know, hey, if you don't get the budget in on time, hey, you shouldn't get pay. We have people saying things such as, like, we want to get rid of the filibuster. Congress itself purpose should be to make laws we know congress itself's purpose is to be more representative with the combination of the senate and the house of what the people want some people argue that the the senate part is a becoming a little outdated there's a there's a conversation because there's some certain relationships that senators have with other individuals compared to house of representatives that's a little shaky but there's really no way we can truly change the the system as of right now i do think there are ways to make it more efficient which is a Mm -hmm. different conversation but in order for us to truly have people who are adhering to the the people themselves my strongest suggestion for people to actually be part of the solution is to be part of your local election absolutely i've been pushing the knowledge starts or the impact starts from the ground up as opposed to from the top down for a long time. One of the other things I've been kind of harping on is the notion of term limits and whether that would have a positive, neutral or negative impact on Congress and and more so specifically be, Congress being more about what people actually want. Cuz I feel like right now Congress doesn't really care so much about what people want. It's about getting to the next election, getting elected, moving up and grabbing power and some of those guys just making money. So on a on a topic of term limits, would that have a positive, negative, or neutral impact? You think on how Congress is performing? I, I don't think it's going to have a large impact in terms of um, what the senators or what the House representatives, what Congress in general does moving forward. In my opinion, um, one thing that I personally do advocate for to kind of make sure that the representatives are a little bit more representative of the populace themselves is potentially changing the way we vote. So Mm. right now, a lot of people, when they vote, they kind of choose the lesser of two evils, right? They Mm. let people spout their nonsense. They let people kind of say their rhetoric. And it's like, man, do I choose this guy who's, you know, he, all he cares about is populist rhetoric or do i choose this guy who seems like all they care about is adhering to the minorities to the point where they're not even caring about what the majority thinks if you kind of get what i'm saying then you kind of know exactly what type of people i'm talking about but there is some systems put in place and i said this on my podcast and there's an organization trying to implement this at the state level 
is mm-hmm. different voting systems that better represent the people. And one of them is called approval voting. So instead of mm-hmm. adhering to only one vote of this representative, you would you choose representatives based off if you approve them, right? So you can choose multiple candidates. Three or four is like, okay, I'm going to choose this third-party candidate. I'm going to choose this one Republican candidate. And I'm going to choose this other Republican candidate. All three of them I approve of. I don't mind if any of them get a seat or get selected. And by that... They all of them that all of that kind of goes into their their participation of um, being part of whatever seat that they're trying to run for. And the reason why something like that is powerful, and that's only one method, there is other methods as well. But the reason why that is more powerful, in my opinion, to kind of make sure that these candidates are really trying are really doing their job is the focus is not I'm going to try to prove why I'm better than them. It's still there, obviously, but the focus will be, okay, let me try to appeal to the people better because I can be selected now. I don't have to do this radical Mm -hmm. rhetoric to try to tear down my opponent. I can try to connect with the audience to the point where they can choose me in addition to choosing Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley. As a third-party candidate, this would be extremely powerful because, like, okay, I know Mm -hmm. they're going to choose Republican, but now they can choose me as well, and now they can go, like, Hey, I like this guy. I think he should put, get a chance as well. So changing the way we vote so it's not kind of this, you know, winner takes all mentality where it's like everybody's truly trying to tear each other down, and which is what politics is. They spend all the time, okay, how am I going to game plan and, and this and kind of appeal to all these individuals in this very toxic way. A perfect example right now is kind of what's going on with Israel and uh, Palestine. I feel like a lot of these candidates recently are definitely saying certain things to appeal to specific demographics so they can get their vote. That's mm-hmm. what I personally think. But now it's, okay, I'm going to tell you what I really believe. I want you to connect with who I am. I know you're going to choose this popular candidate, but you can connect with me as well. And this is what I'm going to provide. So I think that is a better way to kind of make sure that candidates are more, at, or at the very least, uh, uh, candidates in general not the kind of ones that are like a Donald Trump or, you know, Vivek, but other candidates have mm-hmm. a more of an opportunity to showcase who they are and get the opportunity to challenge those people too. And having other people trying to be someone that connects with the, the people who are voting a little bit better. So I think that is a strong method no. in my opinion. Yeah. I like that alternative method of voting. One of the other ones that I've heard is ranked choice voting. Um, which for those that don't know what that is out there, it's basically you, you, you don't, again, you don't pick just one person. You, you rank them in a certain order based on, it's kind of like a single elimination every single time. They kind of eliminate the last one and eliminate the second one. And you get to a, a person based on how people voted one, two, and three uh, to get to the end. What, did, what about that method compared to the method you just mentioned uh, makes that either better or worse? So when I looked into it, Initially, when I heard ranked choice voting, I was in favor of it. It looked pretty cool, obviously. But after kind of learning a little bit more, ranked choice voting actually is relatively inefficient. Um, The two voting systems that I think are the best from what I've seen is called star voting and ranked robin, which is a version of ranked choice voting, but a lot more efficient. And the reason why ranked choice voting is not as efficient, but still better than what we're doing now is because one, you're still kind of doing the same thing by ranking them because number one is still you're going to get all your votes basically. There's a lot of ways Mm -hmm. to mess up because if you don't fill in all the candidates or if you kind of leave things blank, your your vote is completely null and void. So a lot of votes get thrown out the wayside. And because unless it's like a majority winner from the first person, then it's going to keep on doing rounds. And the problem with that is there's a lot of opportunity to mess up the voting and the wrong person getting elected, which actually happened like twice from my memory. So ranked choice voting, still better than what we're doing now, but ranked choice voting has a lot of reasons why it's relatively inefficient. Ranked Robin, which is similar in terms of the ranking system, the difference on why this is better is they put up candidates up against each other so it's like um, if you guys do betting, it's called uh, – I think it's called round robin or, th- or a different mm-hmm. terminology. But the the candidates going up e- against each other and getting ranked that way 
makes it easier to kind of ensure that candidates are one you, there's less chance for voters to mess it up when they're putting their ballots in so their votes count also if you leave something blank or if you don't rank someone your vote will still count so now you don't have that issue with your vote never counting based off some mistake or you just don't want to fill it in and then yeah. by having them compared against each other you have less opportunity to make a mistake from you know the rounds i was talking about before by putting them each other it's easier to kind of um count out and find the numbers to select who the winner is so it's a very it's more of a complicated method compared to like approval voting because all you got to do is count okay he has this many votes he's the most approved mm -hmm. this guy has this many votes it's pretty easy rank choice voting you got to figure out who's uh you got to figure out the number based off their rank they have to be the majority they have to have over 50 percent then you have to do it again if they don't have over 50 percent you have to eliminate the last person and then you have to do it again and then obviously some th votes are taken out it, it can be a lot more complicated than a easy count it up measure gotcha and so uh, real quick electoral college outdated or still relevant lots well, of college is interesting uh especially with with the purpose of it because the idea of electoral college initially from my understanding is it's impo the vote for the general election for the president will be impossible to truly represent what the public thinks. So electoral, co electoral colleges are supposed to make it easier for for the locale, the, whatever the, the district that the electoral college represents, it makes it easier mm -hmm. for the, the those votes to represent the general identity of that area. So mm -hmm. I think from what my understanding is, it made it easier for them to kind of figure out who the president was. Um, and they're initial reasoning or the initial purpose of voting or in comparison to local elections voting for the president was never supposed to be seen as as important as it is today it was never hmm. supposed to be kind of seen as this primary figure that represents america you know the important voting was always supposed to be local election it wasn't until i forget if it was um i'm thinking either Reagan or Nixon, I'm, conf I'm conf I confuse those two all the time, that they, they started making it kind of like a prolific figure that's out in the public and it's like, oh, he's the leader of the United States of America. So with how mm. elections are now, I do think we kind of have to modify it. How we do that, I'm currently unsure, but at the very least, if we kind of ch change our voting system in general, it could be a step in the right direction and eventually modifying electoral colleges. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that in order to change it, we need two thirds of the country to agree to do that, which I don't see two thirds of the country agreeing on anything anytime soon, um, especially electoral Very college. Um, with that, let, let's let's shift a little bit. And this is, this is a very general polarizing question, but maybe you can define this specifically. So what exactly is MAGA and what point in time are MAGA supporters trying to get the country back to? It's been a question I've struggled getting an answer with for a long time. Magas, magas. Um, very interesting <laughs> um, qualifier for, for these people who are Trump supporters. Um, the funny thing is, like, I, back in college, I had a close friend who was a Trump supporter who was a MAGA Republican. But my perception of them now, based off him, was like, oh, I like this guy. He's a good guy. Was like, eh, they could probably could be decent people. And obviously, a couple years down the line, took a step back, kind of looked at what they did. January 6th kind of shed a very, very interesting light. And I had done content regarding politics and Donald Trump, of course, and the Republican pri uh, primaries. And I've come to the conclusion that a lot of Trump supporters are brainwashed. Now, MAGA Republicans, from my understanding, kind of, kind of feeds into this kind of populist rhetoric. Um, and there's... Over the years, there's somewhat of a dissatisfaction on how the government and how the president basically is not adhering to the, the wants of the people. Because we know based off, mm -hmm. you know, how things are with minimum wage kind of rising, but not truly matching the standard of living, right? We know house yeah. prices were going up, rent was going up, car prices are going up. A lot of these things are just 
it's like we want a general better country and our country is obviously better than back in the day in certain ways but it's like it's so much harder to just live a normal life and those mm -hmm. are the people that are upset the ones who just want to live a normal life but it seems like they're struggling all the time to even make ends meet to have a normal meal to have a normal car right they have to do two jobs potentially they have to take a huge mortgage and go uh, big into debt for this i mean college tuition doesn't help this either you know college tuition has went up over mm -hmm. the years so all this dissatisfaction built up and a lot of people were becoming more and more dissatisfied with the elites because we also know the middle class is shrinking and the rich are getting richer and then came donald trump and he completely fed into this whole rhetoric regarding populism despite certain things if you look deep enough it's like donald trump definitely fed into this but he adhered to the people kind of the same way yeah. vivek is doing right now he is talking to the people saying the the government is not doing their job they're not trying to make more jobs for the americans they're not trying to have uh you know make the standard of living better they're not trying to better mm -hmm. the economy they're not trying to help the people you people the normal people, the working class people. And Donald Trump really fed into that so much, especially since he went up against Hillary Clinton, who mm -hmm. was like the worst candidate to go against Donald Trump with all her scandals. Yeah. So yeah. Donald Trump wins. Donald Trump is obviously seen to be the more popular candidate in comparison to the two. And all of that things you know some you know the economy did get more jobs um there are some decent things that he did there's a lot of things he didn't do but magas never talk about that and with that said by having them in captured with this whole rhetoric regarding the government hasn't been helping you i am it made it very easy for donald trump to truly encapsulate them to the point where anytime something goes against donald trump it's the government against me. It's the government against mm -hmm. you. And that's when you have things such as January 6th happening where the people mm -hmm. is like, you're right. Let me, we got to fix the government. We got to fix society. We got to fix America. So by that, and despite everything that's happened and the way Donald Trump was able to brainwash a lot of these people to the point where they think the, the election for Joe Biden and Trump is not even real, the, he fed completely into their dissatisfaction. And that is, as of right now, who MAGA Republicans are. They'll never turn against yeah. Donald Trump because everything against Trump is that, that system that corrupt system that ruined my way of life, they're just trying to ruin Donald Trump. So they're always evil. Donald Trump is never at the wrong. So that's that's how I yeah. that's who MAGA's are in my opinion right now. Yeah, I like to say he he's excellent, damn near genius at demonizing things that people can easily believe are also ruining their lives. And it's it's one of those things where if I feel slighted by this, I don't have proof and it, it really could not even be connected at all. But if he says that it's connected, if he says that he has proof and again, he doesn't even have to prove it. It's enough for them to believe it. And just look at, you know, all the cases he has against him, all the things that happened with January 6th, like you said, um, the, the electoral college, the cases that he brought against the election, all the, I think that one that he lost or were tossed out. That doesn't matter because all he has to do at this point is just say it. it doesn't even have to be remotely or even possibly true, which goes to your brainwashing thing and where I find the most trouble with this, because to me, I don't see how someone can be that gullibly brainwashed just from a person saying something. And so that that's where I struggle with how this went from, you know, coming down an escalator. Well, it actually started before that with a bomb and the birtherism stuff, but coming down the escalator to announce his campaign to where we are today, where, I mean, he's a God to the MAGA group of people in this country. I mean, he can do no wrong. Everything that's possibly going wrong by him is somebody else's fault. How did we even get to that point where that many people succumb to his, his sorcery, if you will? Unfortunately, one thing that I, that I have said 
uh, in different conversations is that people are attracted to the negative things that is going on. And the reason why that is the case, in my opinion, is that people want to fix, they want a solution. So obviously Mm -hmm. when they hear something that's wrong, when they hear something that's negative, their immediate inclination at that point is to find a way to fix that thing. And they don't truly appreciate what is good going on. They don't truly appreciate how great America is compared to like almost every country in the world because it's supposed to be that way. So people are attracted Mm -hmm. to the negative things that are going on and I think it should be better. And in fairness, there's really nothing wrong with that in a way because people want to make sure that, you know, society's good or their version of good at the very least. But we see that by kind of diluting what is bad and and framing it in a very particular way, you can target people's perceptions to any version or any way you want. And by mm-hmm. framing the government, by framing the society, who in reality, for being completely honest, have done a lot of things that was not in the betterment of the people in the first place. So it's kind of easy pickings. And for Donald mm-hmm. Trump already being a figure that they better relate to because he was a celebrity before in any of this, you know, he was on Shark Tank, he was on WWE, people knew who Donald Trump was. And the fact that people mm-hmm. were endorsing his likability because he's a charismatic individual, if you meet him, of course. So it's more relatable. He's different from the establishment. He's not a politician. He's one of us, even though he's not. He's been a billionaire yeah. basically since birth, but that's not how they see it. By having that aspect and kind of differentiating yourself from the establishment itself, it makes it easier to not only connect to Trump, but it makes it easier for you, for people to kind of listen to where he's kind of guiding you. And in reality, it's not even a Trump thing. It happens all the time. Because if you look at like popular individuals, content creators in general, or just like famous people in general, a lot of people with dissatisfaction to a certain extent are very easily kind of pushed to a direction. Because even yeah. though I can say all these things about Trump supporters, I'm going to be honest, I can say a lot of that same thing to the lefties as well. Because a lot of mm-hmm. them have people who are dissatisfied. I'm going to kind of put it out there for me. Like the LGBTQ community, where you have some people, obviously, who are much more sane and rational and trying to advocate for gay and lesbian trans rights. But then you have other people that are de- definitely much more unhinged that kind of see themselves as victims, kind of see the white oppressive societies, kind of how they frame everything. They are directed to think that way. Their beliefs are directed to think that way. And they, because the people that they kind of use as their representatives are different from the white establishment, it's easier for them to kind of agree to the sentiment. So this is just a common thing for people in general. How it got as large as it did with Donald Trump is kind of insane. Then at the at the very least, one thing I will say is that we need to make sure that we're having politicians, representatives that are more willing to connect to the people because we're having a very similar situation with Vivek, who is an individual, not a politician, not a kind of part of the establishment businessman, you know, like us, you know, in a way kind of spouting very similar populist populist rhetoric and he's mm-hmm. extremely popular to the point where he might be he might be threatening DeSantis to the point where he's the third most popular Republican candidate no experience never been into politics basically saying the exact same thing as Donald Trump getting a lot of uh, attention for it of course going on podcasts yeah. trying to adhere to the people even though I don't even think he's a, a great candidate there's a reason why he's popular so these other politicians, what they need to do is they need to appeal to the people better. Kind of like, honestly, whether you think he's a good candidate or not, Barack Obama did. That's what Democrats have to do. They have to appeal to the people, even other Republicans that's not Trump. Appeal to the people, connect with the people, hear what they're saying, reciprocate. And that's how you're going to have to, that's how you're going to overcome people like Trump and Vivek moving forward. 
Yeah, there's, there, I mean, populism is definitely a, a strategy that has kind of transformed politics the last decade or so. But I think one of the other things that's transformed how politics and, and generally in this country things have worked is the media. And we look back at January 6th, we look back at the Dominion voting system, lawsuit, Fox News paying out a billion or whatever that number was. But the ability for, and this is right, left, center, you know, CNN, MSNBC, all of them, they're, they're partisan in one way or another. But there's this notion now that we can't trust the media to provide simple facts in an unbiased way. The way we're having this conversation right now in an unbiased format to just convey the facts to us, not to push an agenda, not to push a candidate, but to convey facts. And to, I don't want to talk about Trump this entire podcast episode either, but I think part of the blame, if you will, for why Trump exploded the MAGA group so much goes to the Fox News of the world, where they really jumped on his back, pushed his rhetoric, whether it was true or not. And a lot of it was proven to be not true. But once you put it out there, it doesn't matter. Once you say it enough and loud enough, people believe it. And so do we have to start holding our media, whether it's Fox, MSNBC, CNN, name them. Do we start have to start holding them accountable in some way to be honest with the people and what they report? I think we're already doing that. Um, uh, to an extent, um, I mean, we have people that are getting fired left and right. Tucker Carlson was kicked off Fox, for example, for some of the dumb stuff he said, and the Fox got sued because of it. Uh, so we're definitely reaching that point where we are holding the media accountable more so than we've ever done before. Um, but I would be cautious from people. I get like in the media definitely pushing out stories that adhere to the people also in part due to the fact that those people are the reason why they're pushing that that out in the first place because like i said mm -hmm. people gravitate to negativity a lot of the times <laughs> um but at the same time you're not going to get much better from social media now you will have great podcasts like this like mine we have other kind of individual content creators that have a expressibility especially with a certain level of sovereignty from any networks or any people trying to kind of dictate them any certain way that will push out the news push out the facts at the very least trying to be objective based on what they're talking about but i would say the majority of the time is social media is filled with the exact same people they're going to push off mm -hmm. false narrative they don't know what they're talking about they're going to push that out trying to get trending Get push up clickbait titles, clickbait news articles, clickbait, all of that stuff. And then you're having to have situations where these people don't have to follow any guidelines and can say whatever they want, you know. So that's kind of the, the dangerous part of social media is the difference from media and social media is you have the better opportunity for individuals to kind of speak the truth. But you also have more opportunity for a lot of people to kind of speak nonsense and don't know what they're talking about, yeah. but get a voice anyway. It's kind of what TikTok is, where everybody thinks they have an opinion. Everybody thinks they know what they're talking about. But in reality, most people don't. They don't do the research. They don't look, look up facts. They don't even look up articles. They read a headline, come up with their opinion, say the opinion, get views. That tends yeah. to what happens more often than not. Um, so with that said, I do like how social media is able to allow people the opportunity and I wouldn't go against that. I, that's why I say people should be cautious on even what they ab uh, absorb on social media. At the very least, we have to, if you're an individual, this podcast, my podcast, that creates content, we just have to be voices that hold other voices accountable better. We just have to be mm -hmm. those type of content where we are providing even our opinion, our facts, but we also realize that if we see something that is wrong, there's nothing wrong with like, hey, man, it's not that's untrue. It's not right. If you mm -hmm. see something that's wrong, if you're commenting on something, it's like, okay, that's not true. I always say on my podcast, hey, if you don't think I'm telling the truth, email me. Maybe you can come on a show. We'll talk about it, right? So I think that that will be a good way. Holding each other accountable, I think, is always a strong way to ensure that we don't fall in the trap that the media has fallen into by pushing these partisan, very – click Betty rhetorics to get views and clicks versus giving out the information. Yeah. It's, it's important to be gatekeepers of, of truth and, and facts. Um, 
one of the things I, I say all the time, I said, if more people use just as a baseline for government, congress.gov, when you're talking about policy, when you talk about laws, when you talk about anything, if we just reference the laws that are written, it would go a long way to just getting the facts out there. Now, whether you agree with the law, don't agree with the law, understand it even, um, at least you can get it out there that you're doing the research. And there, there's so many people I come across that have no idea what congress.gov even does or what you can use it for. Um, for those who don't know, literally you can look up every law that's passed, every single procedure, the steps it takes to get to the law, and all the different votes that happen just to make a law a law. It's kind of like a, a online version of, if you remember that law video way back in like the early 90s of how to make a, a law? It's like that type of thing. But to your research um, comment, my biggest struggle and probably biggest frustration is that so many people push whatever rhetoric or narrative they have, left, right, center, whatever, and when you challenge them on the facts to produce those facts, that's where the conversations go from very cordial like we're having to very heated and debateful, you know, because challenging someone to facts is like the, the thing where you're challenging an entire ideology at this point in this country. How can we, and you know, fact checked out of work used to be something that I think people used to rely on way back in the early teens, if you will, 2010, 11. It was one of the go-to websites, you know, the, the yellow flag or two thumbs up, whatever they used to do. We don't have that gatekeeper where we can say, hey, CNN reported this and that be trusted or Fox reported this and that be trusted. Where, where's our gatekeeper these days besides us? So I, I've spoken to a few kind of like sources that are trying to be those objective sources. Um, I've had the CEO of OtherWeb on my podcast who has a program that is able to filter out kind of this uh, information to the point where it's not uh, kind of clickbaity, where it's not kind of sending misinformation or disinformation. So that's a way to absorb information. I've also had someone who kind of sends out a newsletter that tries to uh, send out nonpartisan um, news that is going on on a daily basis. Um, from what I've read, I think they do a good job. So I do think there are sources out there that we can kind of uh, endorse to an extent for people. Um, the, the, the thing for tw Twitter X or whatever you want to talk about, which I appreciate that they do is that they have the community notes. So mm -hmm. when someone kind of puts out information there, there's an opportunity to kind of put out your notes, community notes to either reinforce, put more context on what is going on or completely debunk and say, this is out of context. This is not true. And then you, people can say, can like basically approve of the community notes and then that is a good way to add proper context and put it f front and center so when you see the image or you see the t tweet you can then see the community notes and, and get the proper context so i think platforms doing stuff like that can be more helpful i think um you know, YouTube tries to do it sometimes based off the conversation. Like if you talk about COVID, they kind of give you a resource to go like, oh, if you want to mm -hmm. learn more about COVID, go over here. So they do that to an extent. It's not the greatest. Uh, TikTok is terrible at this. You can just do whatever you want, basically. Obviously, it has to meet yeah. a certain level of kind of, um, you know, safe for kids, basically. Um, but you could just respond and say whatever you want. It will blow up and people will agree regardless of context, all that TikTok is also not controlled by America. So there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but yeah, social media platforms, having the ability to at the very least, let the public provide the proper context regarding a lot of these things could be a step in the right direction. Some people may argue AI technology can play a lot of dividends, especially if they implement it in so mm -hmm. social media where it automatically vents out all the resources based off what is going on, uh, what is being said and tries to, and can verify if this is disinformation. That's basically what they do for other web. They use an AI to indicate this. So if they can use yeah. the same AI on social media, it'd be very interesting at the very least. Right. But it, it depends on like how much you value the importance of like freedom of speech versus, you know, should people just be able to say anything? That's really up to you. It's really hard to kind of properly gatekeep these things in a legal mm. or technical manner um, for the most part. 
but making giving people the opportunity to provide context like community notes i think could be a step in the right direction for like other platforms at the very least yeah, I used to years ago, uh, there was a website, I believe it's called highlight.org or something like that, where you can actually you put in a URL for any website and it gives you the ability to highlight sections of it and turn it back into another website or a PDF. Um, you can share that with your highlights, actually highlight it. And I used to use that to kind of combat false information, bad narratives, that type of stuff by showing you, hey, here's the congress.org information. But I kind of got away from that because that was just way too uh, resource and time consuming. Um, to get that information out there. But let's shift a little bit from politics, although this is still has a political spin to it, and talk about I'll say gun one violence. Thing and... Real quick. Yeah, um, it's also not bad, and I think this is where some people who kind of get afraid to kind of say their, their piece. It's not necessarily bad to be wrong. It's not necessarily bad mm -hmm. to be incorrect or being misled. Yeah. That's the whole point of conversation in the first place. That's the whole point of interacting with people in the first place is so you can get the better reasoning, the right answer, the solution, because not all of us are geniuses. Not all of us are going to get everything correct. So I think people need to keep that in mind. Yes, you want to be source. Yes, you want to know what you're talking about, but it's okay to be wrong. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, and I think I talked about this last episode where I talked about that we've lost the ability as a general uh, statement. We've lost the ability to absorb new information and change our minds in this country. And that's one of the big problems we've had the last decade, where even if we get new, better, more factual, accurate information, we're so entrenched in our beliefs and our in the way we feel about things that we aren't we aren't able to separate feelings from facts and change our minds when we get new information. That's one of the struggles that I have. Uh, frustrations that I have with what's going on in this country right now. And so let me uh, shift the gun violence and, and permitless carry uh, really quickly. First, I'm going to say state I'm 100 percent for uh, permitless carry. I think every single American um, has a right to defend themselves at any and all times, especially in the climate that we're in now. where you know, going to a movie, going to a mall, going to the grocery store can wine. Uh, you can find yourself with bullets in you. Um, but I think we also have to have the conversation that there are some people in this country who should not have guns whether it's mental health reasons whether it's you know four-time felon which i don't think it's that we have any four-time felons out there i'm exaggerating a little bit um without it being turned into a conversation or that dog whistle conversation that they're coming for your guns can we can we figure out a way to meet in the middle where every single american who has the right to carry a gun have a gun can do so without permits or without permits but also keep those who shouldn't have guns away from guns um, it's an interesting conversation. Personally, I'm against uh, permitless carry. I'm not a fan. Um, I don't think it it makes sense, and it kind of goes into what you're what you're saying in reference to the people potentially uh, the wrong people potentially getting guns. Of course, mm -hmm. um, yes, we know that there's a certain level of background checks when you buy a gun, um, and a lot of these public like areas privately i think the only place you don't um you have to do a background check privately is in maine i think that's the only state other everywhere else there's really no mm. background checks you can just buy a gun and move on with that with your day of course um there's no need i guess technically you can if you if you want to of course and the the tough thing when it comes to kind of like distinguishing these people who have mental health issues and the people who have like a, a criminal history is one regarding mental health is where you draw the line, right? Um, which illness do you say, hey, man, you're, this mm -hmm. is the illness that can't have a gun? I think for the most part, there's a general understanding that we somewhat should be able to agree with with like schizophrenics, for example. But then I've heard mm -hmm. conversations that say, hey, my dad is schizophrenic and he's never done a bad thing in his life. I don't see why he can't have a gun. What if he's about to be held up in gunpoint? Why are you discriminating against him? Right. So unless it's like extremely apparent, it's, it's so hard a lot of the times when it comes to mental illness and mental illness in general is such a tough conversation. But in general, I do think at times we have to find clear lines at some point where we can't allow exceptions to kind of make us not do something 
Okay, so mentally ill, there's just the chance of a mental instability that could go wrong. And that chance at that point should be strong enough for you to, for a, a person to say, hey, you don't have a gun, right? When it comes down to, you know, criminal history, I think at that point, I mean, if you have a, if you have a felon on your record, I don't think there's any justification why you should have a gun in the first place. But at the same time, mm -hmm. then the argument is, okay, well, they'll just get it illegally, right? Or maybe the what's on their record is not representative on who they are now. So there's always a counter argument because everything kind of leads back to the Second Amendment saying, um, you know, the right to bear arms should not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. And I, yeah. yeah, I get that. I get wanting to protect you. I get wanting to protect the people you care about. So the conversation should always be like, okay, what exactly are we valuing in these conversations? What do we want? I personally advocate for better security in a lot of these public areas, especially ones that already have permitless carry. Um, I would be much more um, secure if there was security versus some random individual having a gun trying to protect me. Um, that's That's what I personally think should be very much uh, in the conversation. I also would say that something that needs to be in the conversation is better mental health checks, of course, right? Um, a lot of this, unfortunately, tends to be related to individuals who have broken homes. And that's mm. a little different. That's a culture thing. Very tough answer, tough thing to figure out. But at the very least, there should be somewhat of a program that I advocate for, at the very least in the schools, to make to check with the kids' health, mental health, and a, a, a system in place, kind of like physicals, where there should be mental physicals. Um, so with that said, although I'm against kind of permaless carries, I don't understand the concept, the states that already have it, at the very least, should ensure that in order to protect the people, we shouldn't rely on people with guns, in order to protect the people, yes, they have guns. We should create better systems in general to protect the people as well. Because even a guy with a pistol can only do so much with a guy who brings out an AR, right? So that that's yeah. kind of my my opinion regarding that. No, I, I don't disagree with um, just about all that. I think that when you get into mental health, one of the, the pushbacks I would have on that is, yeah, I completely agree. Schizophrenia on face seems like some characterization of a person who should not have a gun i'd argue that hate could also be characterized as a mental health illness when you talk about uh those who discriminate against certain races or discriminate against certain types of people because of their sexual orientation or or preferences that level of hate has also led to mass shootings and gun violence and so one of those slippery slope conversations that we have is whether we start when we start classifying different types of mental illness what's a bridge too far as far as classifying because some people might say hate is a mental illness and it's although a lot of the you can argue that hate is taught in the home as well but hate is a mental illness in a way if you want to go and target someone and kill someone because of the color of their skin a sexual orientation a political affiliation that's a form of mental illness and so how far do we go or not go with mental illness characterization or classification excuse me it's it's really tough because we're still trying to understand mental health and mental illnesses. The whole conversation is extremely convoluted because I even kind of push back against the the need for medication to a certain extent to kind of put these people back into their status quo. There's really no proven data that taking a bunch of meds is going to make you feel better from what I've seen. Right. I, I get the concept of the medication. It's supposed to ease your mind in a lot of situations. Um, but you can't rely on medication all your entire life, that, especially if it's a mental health thing. That just seems unrealistic. Um, mm -hmm. as, as stuff that's related to trauma, I think, is a little different, of course. Um, they're going to be affected with that their entire life. So I think that's a different conversation. But stuff like depression, ADHD, um, stuff like that, Bipolar. even like, yeah, even when you reference uh, hate, which will be hard to quantify unless there's a hate crime on their record, is extremely mm -hmm. hard to kind of determine the, the validity of them being a gun owner. Um, so at that point, you're, you got to find the, the, the biggest, 
I guess, threat or the biggest risk factor in terms of where mental illness kind of reaches. Um, I guess schizophrenia in general would probably be one of those things. I don't know where exactly what mm -hmm. that line would be, but that's probably something you have to do if you have a permless carry state. And something else I didn't mention yeah. uh, that you should have, in my opinion, if you have a permless carry state, is you need to have gun education embedded into public education. I think, mm. especially since you not required training because you don't have to get a permit or anything, I think since we learn how to drive, if we have a permitless carry state, there's no reason why people don't need to learn how guns are, learn some facts about guns. Not everybody's a gun wielder, mm -hmm. so the expectation everybody's going to pick up a gun and start shooting out at range is unrealistic. But should, people should be aware of what guns are, knowledge about guns. If you want to get gun training, you should be allowed to in a very safe environment. Even people that have a gun doesn't make them a more safer environment. Someone who doesn't know how a gun is, mm -hmm. as you, someone who's never fired a gun, someone who pulls out a gun, doesn't know what they're doing against someone else who has a gun, is just creating a more dangerous environment for everyone involved, if we're being completely honest. So yeah. training, gun training, gun knowledge should be a part of public education. I think that would be very important as well when it comes down to it in a permitless carry states. It might as well, to be honest, if you're going to have this environment. Yeah. And before I get to my last uh, two questions really quick, before we move to the next segment, um, the, these conversations always remind me of the movie Minority Report. If um, you remember that movie, the um, I want to say Brad Pitt all the time. It's not Brad Pitt. Um, uh, I can't remember his name right now. He was in Top Gun. Tom Cruise. There you go. Um, where if you don't know what Minority Report is, it's basically a pre-crime division. So they have these precogs who sense and, and dream about people committing crimes when they capture those those crimes being committed this pre-crime division goes out and stops the crimes from happening. And, and the whole premise of this is they want to do this nationwide. It's in one city because they've stopped murders from happening completely, rapes from happening completely. Um, and so that type of thing, when I have the hate side of this mental health conversation is you can't predict hate. You can't, you can't right. see hate. If you, you know, see some posted on online, social media, you can see patterns, but you can't predict that these 15 conversations or text messages or posts or comments, are going to lead to this event happening tomorrow. Um, and that's, that's part of the trouble with, uh, with, uh, guns and the gun conversation. The other thing I have conversation with people about is insurance and talking about driving, you brought up driving and a driver's license. You're required to carry insurance if you own a car. And so I've said, well, okay, fine. Let's let everybody have guns. We should be able to have guns, but require you to have insurance. And one of the big things I get from starts second amendment defenders, uh, libertarians specifically, is that's not a requirement. That's a, driving a car is a privilege. Owning a gun is a right. And so, even when you get into the nuances of saying, "Okay, everyone can do this," we're, we're conceding that everyone can do this. You still get pushback of trying to put any type of regulation around guns. It's such a tightly held right for a lot of people in this country. Yeah, it's um, I I I get what they're trying to do. But what what I personally think a lot of the time is that these individuals are kind of using um, confirmation bias to adhere to mm. their beliefs, because I don't think they would hold the same type of rhetoric all across the Constitution. I don't think they would. Okay. And something that the Constitution does mention, especially, and I think it's the Tenth Amendment, is the ability to constantly evolve itself to adhere to the next societal standards, right? There's a reason why we have amendments. There's a reason why we have case law is to understand what is going on and apply it to society that is currently. We realize based off historical context, the reason why the second amendment existed is to have the ability to potentially fight against a strong, potential tyrannical, territorial government, or to fight against potentially Great Britain who wants to attack. Um, I heard pirates may be attacking. So there was a need for it because it was, you know, a very small section. It wasn't a huge country like it is now, and it wasn't um, solidified as it was now. So obviously there was a need for it based off how America was created in the first place. Current society is nothing like it was back during the 13 colonies. Um, mm -mm. 
But I'm not, I'm not going to go against something that exists. You know, it's part of who we are as a country. One thing I will say in terms of guns and um, having the, the right to kind of hold the gun is that the intended purpose behind it is one of two things, usually. Protect yourself against a tyrannical government. Get that. And to protect yourself against whatever other individuals that may go against you, right? And in order to do that, you want to ensure a few things, right? You want to be able to use the, the, the product in a effective manner. So not only are you able to protect yourself, but you're able to protect the ones around you. And you want to make sure everybody else is able to use it in an effective manner. So not only protect themselves, but if I'm around you, to protect me if I'm around you. So when you really start breaking down these conversations it should lead to a very specific point. Guns are meant to protect. We need to create ways mm -hmm. that guns can be maximized to protect. If you nobody in their sane mind can really rationalize the idea that I'm safer if someone who's never used a gun before and he's never trained before has a gun. I don't know how you can rationalize mm -hmm. that versus, oh, if he had some training and if he knew how the gun was used, I would be safer. His family would be safer. Yeah. Everybody around you would be safer. Right? And there's no rationale that at the end of the day, the people who acquire the guns should be in the best mental state. They should be in the best character. There, I guarantee if a redneck, if you ask a redneck, hey, man, do you want someone that's part of Antifa holding a guns? They'll say, yeah, they have a right, but there's no way I want to be around them probably what they would say mm -hmm. if you really uh, i think a lot of these conversations they're very tough ones but you really got to adhere to who they are as a human and it's perfect example that I, like happened maybe months ago and i saw an article there was these kids who went to a bus stop they got to go to school they go on a bus go to school this guy was protesting against guns the way he did this is he went next to the bus stop, like a, like a distance away, though. It was like maybe 20 feet, but in eye distance. They, the kids can see him. He can see the kids. And he just held an AR. He stood there every morning when the kids were going to school. No one could stop him. Hmm. He had the right of the Second Amendment. He was holding an AR. Mm -hmm. At any point, you don't know when, he could just pull it up and start shooting the kids. Nobody wants that environment. Nobody would wish that their kid goes into an environment where they can potentially get shot by an AR by going to school. It's ridiculous. So I, in reality, I, I get where people are going from, coming from. But like I said, they're just using confirmation bias. I don't think they truly believe what they're saying a lot of the times. And once you break down the conversation and actually try to find some common ground, I think that you can make them realize that there's definitely certain restrictions that you think guns should have. You don't think anyone and everyone should have mm -hmm. a gun. That's a lie. So that's what I think. Yeah. No, that's a that's a. I've never heard of that. Uh, the guy trying that. I have to look that up to see uh, the full story and and what was the result of that because I'm curious to see how the parents reacted to that. I'm curious to see what the demographic of the area was where he did this at. Um, and, you know the makeup, whether it's you know red, blue, purple, what it was. I'm I'm just curious to see how that how that wound up. Um, last question, talk about your podcast and, and tell us, you know, where this idea, I mean, you kind of talked about it in the beginning, but what do you hope your audience gains from your podcast and what do you see for you, the future of your podcast? So my hope for my podcast is creating an environment that allows for these type of conversations. Um, let me tell you, I've had a lot of different people and a lot of productive conversations. And I don't believe in like, I am going to interview and let you say, let you say whatever you want. I don't, I don't, I'm not there for that. I, I want to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And if I disagree, I'll let you know I disagree. Uh, for example, I had someone who was a uh, former bro Border Patrol. Uh, he came to talk about immigration, uh, talked about some of the inefficiencies regarding immigration. And then, you know, a lot of things I did agree with. I think illegal immigration is not good for the country. I wholeheartedly believe that. But I do think immigration is good for the country. So anytime mm -hmm. he kind of pushed a, an idea that 
what one the country is allowing illegal immigrants due to getting the democratic vote i was like i don't agree with that i don't think you can prove that but when he said things regarding we need to make it more secure it's like i do agree with that so creating these spaces for these conversations and how these conversations are important is valuable for me and the podcast going forward i have some obviously have some big ban- plans to kind of enforce that more so and it will potentially help people kind of realize from different you know creators and different individuals that i've seen on the platform um saying similar things that people should be bigger advocates they should be political advocates of their community they should at the very least vote in their local election all of them don't know what's going on a lot of people don't have the context a lot of people just hear one sign and either and agree with it because it's kind of virtue signaling and morally loaded to think a certain way Mm -hmm. and informing the public and really trying to enforce the power of perspective and experience and the power of having conversations is I think will be a important bridge in dealing with current discourse politically. So people shouldn't be afraid to have political conversations because they don't want it to get heated. People shouldn't be afraid to kind of talk about their beliefs because they're afraid people are going to get upset. Um, We all want a better country. Most people, 95% of people, aren't terrible people. They're not saints by any means, but they're not terrible people. Someone in my last episode said, if you think about this individual, what are the chances this individual will pull your kid out of a burning car? Hmm. Now, I would say 95%, maybe 98% of the people would 100% try to get that kid out of that burning car. So there's a sense of commonality that we all have Unless you're a psychosociopath to an extent, sure. And we just want better. The Republicans, even Trump supporters, want better. Democrats, even um, you know, blue-haired lefties, they want better. So once people start understanding that and try to connect in those conversations, you don't have to be the morally just person. You don't have to be the best person. But at the very least, have that conversation. Understand their perspective and experience. It can help everybody going forward to a better way. We should continuously try to progress this country, try to progress America. I have no envisions of a utopia, but we should progress to a utopia. There is a difference. There is a difference. By creating a better society consistently, we know America has a lot of problems. He named out like seven of them before at the beginning of the episode. All of them can be improved at the very least but it won't be improved if we got two sides constantly saying my side is better my side is better and nothing getting done Mm -hmm. gotcha no very valid points um so that's the the end of the q a and now i'll move to my favorite segment my guest called first thoughts first uh first thoughts is brought to you in part by sra solutions simple solutions for complex problems for over 15 years sra solutions has provided today's solution to prevent tomorrow's problem SRA Solutions will provide effective, efficient, robust, and reliable business intelligence, application, website design, and PC support services. For more information, visit their website at www.sresolutions.org. First thoughts, for those who are tuning in for the first time, as I always say, shame on you, but I'm happy you're here. The way first thoughts works is I offer my guests a word or a phrase to get their first thought. Obviously, I don't give the word or phrase to my guests. That would kind of ruin the uh, whole first thoughts thing. So, Riddell, are you ready? I am ready. Cool. So, I like to start with a softball one. Um, When this episode drops, it will be Friday the 13th. So, my first thought to you is Friday the 13th. What's your first thought? It's my birthday. Ah, happy birthday. (laughs) Thank you. All right. So usually I tell my guests, feel free to elaborate as much or as little as you want to, but it's your birthday. That, that kind of is like a mic drop moment. It's yeah, birthday. it's pretty it self-explanatory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So second first thought, abortion. What's your first thought? I think abortion is a pretty complicated situation. Um, I do understand both sides, the ones who feel for the human life, but the also ones that want to adhere to women's rights. I will say that it is killing a baby. But I think the conversation is much more complicated than 
than just choosing a side. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to give you a bonus one. So, so this wasn't going to be last first thought, but it'll be next to last first thought. Uh, systematic racism. What's your first thought? Systematic racism definitely existed. We all re- realize it existed throughout history. But in current society, maybe in certain institutions, maybe, but I don't think it's a liable reason to kind of give up on America. I don't think it really exists as much or at all today, to be honest. I think a lot of people of color have a lot of opportunity. Sure, there can definitely be discrimination, but I do think that's more of an individual level than a systematic one. Uh, Unless you can trace it back to a historical context, which is very much possible. I'm not denying that. But having the vision that you can succeed is much stronger than thinking that the system will prevent me from succeeding at the end of the day. Okay. And last first thought. The 2024 presidential winner will be, what's your first thought? I think the winner will be Joe Biden, um, regardless of how popular Donald Trump is, and maybe he even will go to jail and people will still vote for him. I think Joe Biden kind of just adheres to Democrats a lot better, moderates a lot better, even some center Republicans a lot better. Um, And I think overall... He actually hasn't been doing a bad job as a politician. It's unfortunate a lot of the situations people are going to blame Biden for, like the economy because of COVID, which wasn't his fault, obviously. Uh, The entire world economy got affected by COVID. Um, A lot of the conflict going on with Ukraine versus Russia, complicated situation. I do think he's doing the best he can be. I do think he could do better by taking a stronger chance to end the war by telling Ukraine, hey, man, you may have to give up some territory. Even the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Be interesting to see how he handles it, honestly. It's a very complicated situation after I looked into the history, so I don't know what the best Mm -hmm. course of action. But if Americans died, then it's very easy to pick a side, honestly. Uh, So with that said, I think Joe Biden will win. Um, But I will say Donald Trump, if he wants the best chance to win, he should make Nikki Haley his vice president. I think she's the most capable Republican candidate that exists currently today. Yeah, I actually 100% agree with that. I think Nikki Haley has shown herself, and, and I've kind of made a conscious effort not to watch the debates um, just because, it's it, to me, it's it's just a shit show, for lack of a better word. Um, but from the clips I've seen, um, Nikki Haley seems like the most sane, polished, prepared candidate uh, compared to all the rest. I agree. So this season... I'm turning over power to my guests before we wrap up in a segment that I call T.O. First Thoughts. Now, the brainchild behind this idea uh, was a very, very good friend of mine now, turned girlfriend, or better half, uh, my T.O., who came up with this idea for my guest to turn it back around on me and offer me a first thought. So, uh, Riddell, what's your first thought for me? Hmm, first thought for you, um, third parties. Hmm. I am all for third parties. I think the best, one of the best ways to fix politics in this country is to build up and produce a strong third party where I think if you do that, Democrats, Republicans will actually have to work for the vote because right now independence, you know, there's independence in the Senate, there's independence in the house. They really don't have much of an influence either. Even though Joe Manchin, he was independent Democrat. I don't know what the hell he is from day to day, but their influence on politics is not very strong. And so when you get into situations, and you also have rules that that prevent them from actually participating fully in some of the the presidential campaigns and some of the other elections throughout the country. But I think if we build up a coalition, you have the Green Party, you have uh, Straight Independence, you have, um, I forget what the other one was, uh, Jill Stein and the other person ran under that party uh, last election. Um, But when you have, I think, a strong third party that takes up maybe... 20%, 25% 20%, 25% of the the body that produces better candidates, I think, from Democrats and for Republicans, because now they have to actually do real work and actually produce results that the people can actually feel and see. So I'm 100% for third parties, 100%. All right. Sounds good. I am as well. I am as well. And I do think the new voting systems can help um, allow third parties more representation, especially since you don't have to only vote for one candidate. Gotcha. Well, Riddell, I want to thank you for uh, stepping into Dave's head, as I always do with my guests before you go. 
I'd like to offer you the opportunity. If there's anything you want to talk about or promote, feel free to do so now. All right. Well, if you guys want to support my podcast, The Purple Political Breakdown, feel free to go to my website, www.purplepoliticalbreakdown.com. You can find all the content over there. You can find a means to contact me. You can support the podcast. Very easy website to navigate and very easy website to kind of get involved in what we're doing over here. Um, but yeah, other than that, I hope you guys did enjoy today's show. I think it was a great conversation. And uh, I think a lot of people will get something out of it, of course. Great. And I definitely, I checked out your website. I definitely agree. Great content, um, great format. You can see all, especially I like the fact that you have all your guests that you've had on um, kind of featured and highlighted on your website as well. Uh, gave me some ideas, tell you the truth. Um, but uh, I do want to thank you again for stepping to Dave's head and take care and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. My favorite segment of my podcast is My Grin, which stands for great reason to be in love with now. You know, summer has come and gone. And as we move into the chillier months, and by the way, I'm not one of those people that turns on heat until like we get a frost, like a serious frost, like mid 30s, upper 30s type of frost. But as we get into these chillier months and the holidays approach, um, we start to realize that there are people in our lives that we haven't talked to or seen um, or old friends we haven't seen in a while. And it might be time to simply reconnect. The fall is a great opportunity uh, to do that because it's after the summer, you're taking summer vacations or, you know, if you're teaching, you're definitely out because you haven't been able to get out for a while. Um, or maybe you're just going to see family, different parts of the country. Maybe you're just too busy. But as we get back to the fall, you're spending more time at home. You know, you have more opportunities. I have several people in my life that I've been friends with for a long time. I'm talking like, you know, it don't matter what, when I see them, how often it is between the times I see them. Um, or how long it is, excuse me, between the times I see him, it's like nothing ever changed. Just pick right back up and, and just keep on going. Like we saw each other yesterday. Um, but not all friendships are like that. Some friendships you need to put in some effort, um, make some advances, and, and really do a lot to get that rekindle and rev back up after a period of time. The everygirl.com has an article from this summer, actually, it's entitled Six Non-Awkward Ways to Reconnect with an Old Friend. Now, why is this important? Number one, if you truly have someone in your life that's a friend, regardless of how often you talk to them, how often you see them, I'm not a telephone talker like that. Uh, my friends and I, we, we text. <laughs> you just you know what to text me. Now, I do speak on the phone. I absolutely do. And there's some friends that call me, they don't text, which is cool. But I'm, I'm a texter. You get at me anytime you want to, 24 hours a day. Now I may not answer because my Do Not Disturb turns on at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, whatever time it is. Actually, I think it's 10.30. But I'm not much of a talker on the phone. Now we can WhatsApp, FaceTime, and all that stuff. And I do that every once in a while too. But nine awkward ways to reconnect with an old friend. One of the things I would talk about real quickly is that non-awkward thing. And my trouble with that wording is that if you're if it's awkward to reconnect, that tells me either there's a falling out, the friendship is not that strong, or there's something else that's going on that makes it awkward just to reconnect. Because if, if they're your friend, it don't matter how long it should be or how long it's been between times you've talked or seen each other. They should be like, hey, what's up? Granted, every friendship's not perfect. So they talk about these six different ways. And the first way they talk about, which I think is actually pretty achievable pretty easily, is engage on social media and they say social media allows us to keep up with the old friends on a surface level but if you actually want to rekindle a friendship you have to engage with them more than just liking their posts an easy way to do this is by leaving a genuine comments on their posts replying to their stories or sending a dm to open up conversation now pretty simple right especially if your friend is active on social media and you are too it can be a like it could be a comment it can be one of those things where you say, hey, remember that time when blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, you have memories that pop up, share a memory. Hey, so-and-so, remember this? This was kind of cool. It makes perfect sense. The second way, which is probably my way, um, is send a quick text. Say hello, ask them how they are, let them know you're thinking about them, ask them, frankly, to get together. And if you don't have their number anymore, 
red flag on a friendship. Just, just, just saying, unless somebody lost their phone. Um, and even then, if you're connected on social media, hey, I lost my phone. What's your number? Okay, red flag. Just saying. Um, you can ask a mutual friend for it, or engage them on, on social media. Send them an email. But again, if you don't have their number anymore, it kind of is a little red flagish about the friendship. The third thing, get together with mutual friends. Now, I kind of like this one because it's a group setting, number one. You don't have to focus so much on rekindling the friendship because there's a bunch of other people there. But they say, make plans to get together as a group is a low pressure way to reconnect because your mutual friends will be there to help bridge the gap and prevent any dull or awkward get to know you again small talk. This is a good option for you if you're really nervous to reconnect and or want other people there to keep the conversation flowing. Again, a little red flag is about the relationship if it, you feel that awkward where you need people to be there. But there's no harm in people being there just in general and you inviting them. But I think there's a difference between having hey, a group and you invite somebody that you want to reconnect with versus inviting a group because you need them to help you reconnect with somebody. And if you are, and by the way, these red flags don't mean there's a friendship that's dying or dead or the suspect to begin with. It just means there's more work that you might probably need to do with this friendship or that friend too, in order to get that back to a place of comfort. Number four, which is interesting that they put this in here because this, is, this kind of speaks to my whole something's got to be going on, red flag waving things I've been talking about, work through conflict. Did you two have a falling out, right? Unfortunately, we've all been there. By making the first move and reaching out to resolve the conflict, you're taking the first step towards building a trusting friendship again. It is important to clear the air and be open about why you're reaching out in the first place. Make your intentions clear. The most important part is that last line. Make your intentions clear to me. Because whether you had a falling out or not, it could be a misunderstanding that's only one side and you have no idea about, right? Those things happen. Miscommunications happen. However, being intentional about why you're reaching out to them and what you're trying to do. I'm trying to make sure we're good. We haven't talked for a while and you know, maybe our social media has been kind of like short when I text you kind of like, Hey, an okay, an okay, or like a thumbs up emoji or something like that. That's not really how we use to communicate. I'm trying to make sure we're good. And if we're not good, let's work through it and get back to a place of comfort. Being intentional is the way to go about this from the jump, regardless of why you guys have not had, great contact recently number five i kind of touched on way back in number one i think but number five is share memories did you come across old pictures and see something that reminded you of them send it their way with a short message for example if you see something online that has something to do with you that they might be interested in tag them and say something like this reminds me of you ha 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 they didn't say the ha 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 part i did but this is an easy way to open up the conversation that doesn't seem super random. But let's pause for a second. Five kind of contradicts number four to me because we can't talk about being intentional and then try to throw something that kind of connects the dots and say, hey, this reminds me of you without addressing whatever the reason is we're not talking. So while I do like the idea of reaching out based on something that may be including both of you from the past or something that may be you know, something they're interested in that, you know, they're interested in or something any between those two. I think the message should be, Hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. This reminded me of you. I miss what's going on with us. I don't know what's going on with us. Is there something we need to talk about? As opposed to say, Hey, this reminds me of you. Ha ha. Remember I added the ha ha part. The last thing is number six, which I think gels very well with number four, which is ask if they want to get together. Don't want to beat around a bush? Duh. Be straightforward and ask if they want to get together. Duh. Life moves very fast. So if you want to reconnect, just ask, ask before more time passes by. Odds are they'll be glad you reached out and might have a meaning to do the same thing. Again, going back to number four, make your intentions clear. Hey, you want me to go for some drinks? Haven't seen in a while. Simple as that. Just... Ask if you want to get together. What are you doing this weekend? I'm free. You want to get together? Have a place in my... Hey, I remember you like that sushi spot. Want to meet there for happy hour? Be intentional. Again, I'm not saying I totally disagree with sharing the memories of number five. I'm just saying find a better way that's more intentional to do it. That's all. 
Here's the important thing to me in friendships. Know your friendships, period. Are y'all beefing? How close are you? Are they a talker, a texter, an impersoner? Not a word. It's my word, impersoner. Do they marinate on things or address them head on? Because again, knowing your friendship could be, well, I haven't spoken to them in three weeks. We usually talk every week. We did kind of both get drunk a month ago and we kind of said something to each other that wasn't normal. Maybe they're marinating on it because they like to marinate on things before they come and address it. Or are you both just too busy and need to make time for each other? Could be as simple as that. Nothing's wrong whatsoever. Y'all just need to figure out some time. And other than that, y'all good. Fall presents a great opportunity to reconnect. You got sports, you got unexpected good weather, you got the just because situations in the fall. And I think looking at it that way, identifying friendships that you have that need some TLC. Looking at that opportunity now that you have the fall weather, you got Halloween coming up, you got Thanksgiving coming up, you have Christmas coming up, you got New Year's coming up, right? If you have a situation where you have a friendship that's a little rocky right now or just kind of in limbo because you have no idea what's going on with it, but it feels awkward. You don't want to invite them over or go to their house for Thanksgiving with that awkwardness. You don't want to invite them over for Christmas dinner or go to their place for Christmas dinner or go to New Year's Eve party and bump into each other and y'all cool, but eh, we're not really cool. And you don't know why. Be intentional, reach out and really find a way to rekindle your friendship if it's meant to be a lasting friendship. And if not, at least you did your part. Simple as that. But I'm banking on the fact that if you have a friendship that's in that category, it simply just needs a little more attention. I want to thank Rydell Lewis for stepping into Dave's head and having a very, very nice conversation about politics and the state of this country. I think it's important that when people get together and talk about polarizing topics, whether it's politics, religion, and so many other things, that you do so from a place of humble understanding. That you look at it as an opportunity to gain knowledge, not just regurgitate what you know. And I think that was important with the conversation we had today because it's not just about his beliefs, my beliefs, where they match, where they don't match, where they intersect, right? It's about getting positive factual information out there and letting people decide for themselves. Maybe be open to change in your own mind. And that's what we really need more so not only in politics, but in so many topics in this country and generally in this country as, as just a whole. A willingness to adapt, right? Adopt and be open to changing based on new information. I talked about this last episode, that we've lost that ability. We've lost the ability to take new information and allow it to possibly change our mind about something. But I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Rydell today. Um, I thoroughly did. I think uh, he has a lot of good, nice opinions. You know, a couple of things we disagreed on, but very, very nice opinions. Check out his website, www.purplepoliticalbreakdown.com. You can find him on Instagram at Purple Political Breakdown, YouTube as well, Purple Political Breakdown, and so many more um, avenues and social media. Just check out his website. You'll find them all. Support our sponsors, Dig a Movers, for all your safe and swift moving needs, and SRE Solutions for all your IT, consulting, network, antivirus, and so much more needs. And if you're interested in sponsoring Dave Said, Reach out to me on any of my social media and we can make it happen. So roll tide and reconnecting. All great reasons to be in love with now. That's all for this episode of Dave's Head. New episodes release on the second and fourth Friday of the month. For all things Dave's Head, check out our website at daveshead.card with two R's dot co. Subscribe to watch new episodes on YouTube or Spotify video. Or to listen via your preferred podcast player, go to anchor.fm forward slash Dave's Head Pod. Thank you for watching or listening. As always, enjoy life because life should be fun. Take care.